Hey everyone, so uh, welcome to the chapter 5 lecture. So what we have in chapter 5 is kind of a chicken and the egg, which came first scenario. Um, we've been learning to code JavaScript, um, but as many of you notice, when, when JavaScript breaks, it tends to break pretty hard. In other words, you know, if you forgot something when you were writing HTML and you didn't write something exactly correct, Sometimes HTML and CSS, it can be a little forgiving um, and still kind of work. You know, maybe something isn't exactly where you want it on the page. Maybe it's off to the side a little bit or, you know, you could get things working a little bit easier with HTML and CSS. So those were more forgiving languages. But when something breaks in JavaScript, it tends to break pretty hard and all of a sudden the entire page doesn't work. You know, nothing works. And so what we're learning today is how to um, find bugs and how to fix bugs and uh, a bug is just a, a problem with your with your code um, a problem with the, the JavaScript that you've written or maybe maybe a problem with the HTML that you've written or maybe a problem with the CSS you get the idea it's just a problem with the code um, so I say it's chicken and the egg because it's like well you know do you learn to code first and then you learn to fix the code or maybe do you learn to fix the code and then learn to code because if you learn it that way if you learn to fix the code first and then you learn to code then when you encounter problems then you can fix them more easily um, because you have some tools in your tool belt to fix problems and that's what this is all about this is all about learning some tools to put in our tool belt to fix problems or do you learn to just write the code first and then when it breaks kind of hard to fix because you don't really have many tools in your tool belt um, so that's what this chapter is all about is finding mistakes and uh, fixing mistakes oh, go away um, kind of go quickly through the objectives kind of skip those slides We'll hit on all these topics throughout the, the PowerPoint. Um, the first thing to realize um, is that there are two different processes. Um, the, the first process is what they call testing. And, and testing is a process of locating bugs. Um, it says the goal of testing to find errors, bugs, errors, I use those interchangeably, before the application is put into production. And so one thing that I'll add to this, the goal of testing, um, you know, there are full-time jobs just doing testing. Okay, um, sometimes those are the kinds of entry-level jobs that you might get after you graduate from from school uh, or, or testing jobs and the idea of a tester is that you're using the software and you're trying to break it right in other words you're trying to find problems with the website you're trying to pro find problems with the JavaScript or, or whatever it may be um, these full-time jobs uh, you might have heard of the QA quality assurance team and what they do is they, they look at the, the website once it's ready to go live. And again, they stress test it. They, they, they put it through a lot of stress. They're gonna put, they're gonna input all kinds of information to try to get your program to output uh, bad results. And so it's the job of testers to break your code. Okay, you have to write your code so that it doesn't break. And so, you know, if you ask for a number between 1 and 100, you know, they're going to input everything from negative 1 million to positive 1 million. They're going to input letters, they're going to input special characters, they're going to put into the program any sort of information that they think might break your program and 
that's just on a single text box, right? On a single piece of information. But a lot of times it's more complex. You know, bugs can be very complex scenarios where, you know, you're checking out at this time of day, you're this kind of, you know, a certain kind of user is purchasing something on a certain time of day using this product code. With that scenario, the website breaks. Okay, it's the job of the testers to find the, the breaks before it goes live. You know, obviously before it goes live is a big, is a big deal because um, you, you'd rather your testers find the problems than your end users. Um, it's, you know, it's, it's this way regardless of whether you're, you're writing web pages or whether you're building mobile apps uh, or whether you're building like operating systems, you know, that's the goal of testing. Then the goal of debugging, let me make sure I got my chat room pulled up in case anyone wants to chime in. One second here. Debugging then. Um, there's an old, you know, story in in the software world where the term debugging comes into play. Um, I'll, I'll quickly tell this story. Maybe you've heard it. Um, you know, in the old days, computers were ginormous and they were slow. And and when I say they were ginormous, I mean they were the entire the size of an entire room, right? Uh, and so. You know, imagine uh, mechanical equipment the size of your house. You know, the giant rooms um, full of mechanical equipment to compute, you know, um, input, do math um, based on what the, you would feed the computer. And um, one of the early computers. Um, they were giving it some numbers like two plus two and it was getting a bad output or maybe no output. You were inputting two plus two and the computer was not giving any output. And so they're like, well, what's going on? This should all work. They can't figure it out. And so what they do is they go into the big room. They, essentially, they walk into the computer and they're looking at all this mechanical equipment, these giant, you know, cables and um, the, these giant uh, drives, you know, these magnetic hard drives that are huge and the story goes that they the problem was that they found a moth a, a big moth that had gotten into the computer and was kind of uh, caught in between uh, like the read and write head of the hard drive so this hard drive was trying to you know uh, write some information to this mechanical disk you know to this metallic disk uh, but there was a moth trapped in between the disc and the, the read and write head. And so the, the fix then became removing the moth, debugging, aka debugging the computer, taking the bug out of the computer, and that fixed the problem. So that's where the term debugging came into play. Um, you know, so the goal of debugging is again to fix the errors uh, before the application. Uh, is put into production. And so testers, like QA people, sometimes uh, sometimes testers have coding background. Uh, sometimes testers do not have coding background. I mean, I know some people personally that they were able to do testers. I mean, you think about it, you're just trying to to break the, the, the program. And so you don't really need to have to know how to write code. Okay, so I know testers who have coding backgrounds and I know testers who don't. Um, but debugging, you know, once they tell you that there's a problem and a problem is identified, you have to know how to write code to fix the software. And so debuggers are really just developers that are fixing problems. Okay, and again, the goal is to do this before production. Um, but as you know, no software is perfect. 
uh, most every piece of software has bugs. And so, of course, you want to fix this before it goes live. But the reality is, I mean, how many pieces of software can we all know and relate to and work with that are released with bugs? Um, it's pretty much all of them because, well, we're not perfect and we don't write perfect code. And so when it comes to the kinds of errors that you can can happen, you need to get familiar with these three types of errors. Um, the first is a syntax error. Uh, syntax error is the idea of you're not following the rules of the language. Okay, examples of that are things like, um, are, are you writing JavaScript in a case sensitive way? Because remember, JavaScript is very case sensitive. Um, are you putting semicolons in the right place? Are you putting um, parentheses? Also, you call them parens. Are you putting parentheses in the right place? Are you putting curly braces in the right place? Okay, so if you think about this, you know, English as a language has a, has a syntax. Where do you put the commas? Where do you put the periods? Where do you put the quotation marks? All of these characters, um, all of these symbols have a very specific meaning in the English language. And it's the same thing in JavaScript. There's all of these, all of these symbols, semicolons and parentheses and curly braces, and you have to follow the rules of the language to put them in the right places to code JavaScript correctly. If you're not following the rules of the language, you have what is called a syntax error. Okay, so that's what a syntax error is. Um, a runtime error, so typically if, if you have a syntax error, typically what that means is that your code doesn't run. Okay, you cannot get your code even to a running state. Okay, so it's so broken that that it doesn't run and so syntax errors are very critical and when I talk about JavaScript breaking hard uh, I'm typically talking about um, syntax errors okay runtime errors are errors that occur you get past the syntax error so you're no longer you, you're you're following the rules of the language um, but other factors that that might be outside of your current control um, could cause the program to crash maybe it's in your control to fix it maybe it's not um, I'll give you an example um, we can use JavaScript to write cookies okay and what cookies are are small files that are stored on your computer's hard drive about the end user and so you know if you've watched if you've watched that movie that I recommend on Netflix called The Social Dilemma uh, it's a great documentary and what that is all about is how social media companies kind of gather a a, a sea of information about you they, they basically gather all the information in the world that they can gather about you everything you like who you like you know how you watch your videos all that information right they store that information about you and then they use that against you to basically get you addicted to their products okay a cookie is the most primitive way of gathering information about a user it's just a way of saving information about a user on their hard drive or you could ultimately save it on another hard drive. It doesn't have to be on their hard drive. You could save a cookie um, to your web server, for example. Um, okay, well, part of a cookie is to uh, save a file. So cookies um, save files to hard drives. Okay, well, what happens if that hard drive is full? Okay, you're, you're, you're gonna get a crash. Your, your software is going to crash because there's no more room on that hard drive to save the cookie that you wrote the JavaScript to save the cookie, but there's no room on the hard drive. The hard drive's full. And so um, runtime errors typically, um, they typically crash your program. Um, and, and some scenarios are, are like this where 
you know, oh, you tried to save a file to a hard drive and there's no hard drive space, or um, maybe you tried to save something to a database and that database is down, like the database literally isn't even running. Um, another example of a runtime error um, would be an infinite loop. I mean, you can write a whole bunch of JavaScript and then a scenario could come up where you would have a loop that doesn't end and just goes over and over and over an infinite number of times um, that could crash the program. And um, so runtime errors, the programs are running, but then they're crashing. Um, typically lead to a crash. Okay, and in a web page, we've all seen it before where it says web page not responding. Okay, web page not responding um, is an example of a runtime error um, that typically maybe some code was encountered that uh, crashes the software, crashes the web page. Okay, um, infinite loops uh, is, is just one example of a runtime error. Um, logic errors are also um, while the program is running. So the program is running and, you know, I, I see this a lot in this class. Um, you're doing the hard part. The hard part is learning the JavaScript. The, the part that isn't as hard as learning JavaScript well, I guess it's, this is a matter of opinion, but is the arithmetic that, that is needed to solve problems. And so, you know, to calculate miles per gallon, you know, miles per gallon, there's a formula. Miles per gallon equals, uh, you know, miles driven divided by uh, mile, uh, gallons consumed. So if you drive, is that EN? Miles driven divided by gallons consumed. So if you drive, you know, 100 miles and you, you consume two, you know, you get 50 miles per gallon, right? And so there's just, you know, um, arithmetic that's needed to solve real world problems. Real world problems are often, you know, they can be very complex and they can, and they can take complex math to solve them. Okay, but most of the problems in this class aren't aren't overly complex. They're they're kind of uh, um, you know basic algebra level questions. But you have to be able to do um, you know some basic arithmetic. And point being, logic errors. Or what if you get this wrong? What if you said well, you know what if you said two divided by one hundred? If if you simply didn't do the math right. Uh, what do you get there? Two divided by 100 is like a 0.5, is that right? Off the top of my head, that makes sense? No, yes. Normally I can do this math off the top of my head, but I'm just not in math mode right now. Two divided by 100, oh, okay, 0 0.2, 0 0.02, yeah. Bad, should be able to do that, whatever. Um, so, so if the correct answer is you're going, you're getting 50 miles per gallon, you know, you're talking about a, uh, you know, the kind of the miles per gallon of a, um, like a, I don't know, um, can't think of that car. What's the car that has, um, that's a hybrid that gets 50 miles per gallon? Whatever. Prius, hey, thank you. You know, if you're getting talking 50 miles per gallon, you're talking about the miles per gallon of a Prius. That's, that's pretty great. You know, if you're talking about a .02, you know, you might be talking about like the uh, the Hummers of the early 2000s, right? That <laughs> got some. It, it's not miles per gallon; it's gallons per mile. Uh, you know, in in those giant tanks. Um, and so there's a pretty big difference, right, in your output. If you're getting this number on, on the output instead of this number, you know, that's a, that's a significant problem. That is a logic error, and that is more an error with your logic as far as how you understand how to solve the problem. Um, and so these are the three types of errors that can occur.
Okay, and if you take a look at this uh, little bit of code, um, yeah, yeah, Hummer is coming out with an all-electric Hummer. Uh, so GM announced that they have an all-electric Hummer, and uh, I don't know, they, they announced like a hundred of them, uh, not hundred, like a hundred thousand or whatever, but apparently all the reservations are sold out. You could not, you could not buy, you could not reserve one. The entire first batch of electric Hummers is sold out. Um, which I think is pretty funny because they're reviving, uh, they're reviving that. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm a huge fan of the of the electrification of cars. Big big fan of that. Um, slide six shows a logic error, right? Because um, the output of the program is just the result of some bad math, and so. Um, that's your logic error. Now, um, syntax errors, uh, again, I kind of went through them, you know, being case sensitive, knowing where to put your quotes, knowing where to put your braces, um, knowing where to put the semicolons, you know, spelling things correctly. You know, those, those are, those are, I, you know, I remember being a student and going and seeing these slides and it's like, these are the common things. This is how to fix these problems. And let me tell you, there's no like memorizing this slide and all of a sudden you're good at troubleshooting. Just because you memorize this slide, you know, you're not going to be good at troubleshooting. The way that you get good at troubleshooting is by practice troubleshooting, you know, practicing troubleshooting. And so, um, yes, I would agree with this slide. I, I would agree that I've you know, that's what my job is. My job is troubleshooting. When you have problems with your code, I have to step in and find the problem. I have to debug uh, uh, 24 students' uh, programs every single day. And so this is, this is my job. If I'm good at this, if I'm good at fixing problems, um, then I'm, that means I'm probably gonna be, um, I don't wanna say a good teacher, but, but that makes me a competent teacher, right? Um, because you can be, you can be good and also not be, or you can be competent and not be good, I should say that. Like you can know JavaScript, but that doesn't make you a good teacher automatically. Okay, I agree with these things, but I don't think there's like memorization needed here. Um, another thing, another things, uh, one second, I got an emoji to throw onto here. This is that emoji, there we go. Um, when you're getting something by ID, uh, you know you're 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 now linking the JavaScript to the HTML. So sometimes the problem might not be with the JavaScript. Your JavaScript might be written correctly. You might have to go into the HTML. Like maybe the ID that you have in your JavaScript is what you want the ID to be, but in your HTML the ID is not what you want it to be. So you might have to go into your HTML and fix the problem. And, and I'll kind of give you a heads up. Uh, your next hands-on test, uh, you will be doing some, some debugging. And so just make a mental note or, or make, a, make a note on your notes that um, keep an eye on the HTML because the problem isn't always the JavaScript. Sometimes you're gonna find problems in the HTML as well. Okay, let's see this slide. Slide nine, problems with data and comparisons. Uh, okay, couple things to keep in mind and I'll, I'll kinda expand on these things. Um, let's talk about the second bullet first. Not using the parse in or parse float. You might remember if you've got two variables that are strings. Okay. Um, this is not ideal. I should be doing this in my editor here. So we got variable one, we got variable two, and if we say alert, uh, var1 plus var2. Okay, remember what this does. 
what this does is concatenation because we got these in strings it got them in quotes therefore when you add strings together you get concatenating values so instead of getting the output of three like you would expect here instead they they literally uh, put the two on the end of the one you get the output of 12 okay and so you in order to do addition here you need to parse the strings into uh, parse it into an int parse int something along these lines and that way when you do this as long as one of them is is an int the results should be a number right so as long as you convert one of them to an int you should not have to convert both of them the output should that should fix it so um, using parse int and parse float in the right scenarios um, on this bullet uh, we might have an if statement if uh, first name equals Bob okay well keep in mind that when we're trying to test to see if first first name equals Bob we want to use two equal signs this is the comparison operator a single equal sign is the assignment operator so what actually happens if you were to code it like this it would actually put the value of Bob in first name and then this would be true every single time this is always going to be true because what you're actually doing is you're putting Bob into this first name um, which makes this a true statement so this would always be true this would be tested for the truth um, so don't forget that um, and um, this one's talking about not a number, right? So um, before you go doing some math, you want to make sure that what you have, if, if you have something that's not a number, you don't want to do some math on it, right? If you have a letter, you don't want to you know, multiply A times 9 because that makes no sense. Um, so you want to make sure it's the right data type. You want to use these methods to get it into the right, to, to convert it to the right data type. And this is all about comparing it correctly. Um, as we've seen before, when you're doing uh, arithmetic on floating point numbers, um, you can get rounding errors and so what we have here is this math like if we throw this into the calculator right we'll do 74.95 times 0.1 this is what you get in the calculator this is the right this is the right output 74 uh, 7.495 in which case in our dollars and cents you only have two places so this rounds up to 7.5 and what you wind up in JavaScript you wind up with this trailing 0000001 uh, that's just a result of the way that um, the way that it does math um, at a computational level at a low level um, you know that's that's the result that you get and so the the simple solution is to round it um, is to round your variable um, to two decimal places and you know that's that's the, the simple solution when rounding uh, your math uh, or when you're doing arithmetic on floating point numbers um, you know the book goes into a um, scenario where let's let me read this real quick remind myself so I'm pretty sure I know what this is saying but I wanna if you don't use strict mode and you assign a value to a variable that has not been declared JavaScript engine treats as a global variable. 
Oh, okay. So what's what are they highlighting here? They're highlighting sales tax with a capital T. And then what happens is the programmer made a mistake and they did sales tax with a lower case T. What actually happens on that line where he sets on this line where it says sales tax with a lower T is it creates a second variable. If we remember we don't have to use the keyword let or the keyword var when declaring variables. We can actually just give it a name and we can leave off the var keyword or leave off the let keyword. And if we do that, if we just create a variable without let or var, it's automatically a global variable. Remember last lecture we talked about we don't want lo uh, global variables because what they do is they cause accidental conflicts and they cause problems. And so the, the simple thing is this, use strict. If you use strict, then you can't do this. Um, but also, also use the keyword let instead of the keyword var because the keyword let is a slightly more strict version of var, um, which, which again, when, you're, when you have strict um, rules on your variables, you, you end up with less problems. Um, so using let over var is one thing that you can do, and also using strict is another good thing to do. Okay, and then here they go through, and they're, they're really just talking about testing here. It's like when you're testing, what you do is you test your software with all the possible inputs that are considered valid, right? So, so as a tester, as a QA person, and that's your title at your job, quality assurance, you're gonna test it with good input and you're gonna test it with bad input. And you're gonna make sure that the program responds how it should respond with both, with both good input and uh, bad input. Um, so that's, that's those two bullets there, number one and, and number two. Test it with good, test it with bad. Um, and, and so as a tester, what you do is you need to you need to not only know, you need to know what the output is, okay? So you need to know if I give it all these good input values, what are all the values that I should receive out, right? So you have to know the answers and, and expect the correct answers. Um, so a good tester might have a spreadsheet of inputs in one column and then outputs in another column and then you just run the program over and over and over give it all the good inputs and make sure you get all the good outputs um, and, and the same thing with the good entries and the invalid entries okay so what happens? Well, if you don't test well enough, then bugs find their way into production and then the end users ultimately um, find the bugs, okay? Um, an end user maybe might not be as computer savvy as you are. You're computer savvy just by the nature that you're in this class, right? You, you understand computers enough that you want to study them and you want to make them better by writing good software. So your computer savviness is automatically higher than most average people. So they don't know how to use software very well, let alone write software, which is what, which is what you're doing. Since they don't know how to use the software, they're more than likely going to put in inputs that you wouldn't expect. Um, so you have to you have to bulletproof your software for the least savvy of users because if you don't bulletproof it, what I mean by bulletproof it is test it and make sure that there's no ways to break it. Okay, so if you don't test a wide enough range of entries, your end users will. If, if you put an input in and you don't know what the right output is and it gives you the wrong output and then you put it into production and your users use your program, they get the wrong output and then they use the output as part of their daily transactions and is what they're doing, um, you know, they're not going to like your software too much. 
And they're going to say, well, see, I should just use my pen and paper instead of using your software. Okay, um, I've been going for about 35 minutes. What I'm going to do is pause here for a short break. Okay, uh, we're back from break. We left off on slides 17 and 18, and um, this portion of what they call top-down coding and testing. Um, the idea is this. Um, <clears throat> as human beings, um, a very efficient way, common way, a, a way that we solve problems as human beings is when when you have a large problem to solve, um, to break it into much smaller steps. And that's what top-down coding and testing is. Uh, you break down the problem uh, that you're trying to solve, which is most likely a very large problem, and you break it down into much smaller chunks. And so what you look here when I say chunks, they got phase one, phase two, phase three, and phase four. What they do is, you know, phase one is just get the code working uh, is, you know, the basic, uh, you know, minimum. Phase two is to then add data validation. Uh, phase three is to continue adding validation. And phase four is to add the finishing touches. And so the idea is just, you know, it's as simple as this. Write a little bit of code, launch it, and test it. Make sure it works. Don't write, you know, a thousand lines of JavaScript just to find out that nothing works. Write five lines. Test it. Make sure it works. Add to it. Test it. Make sure it works. Add to it. Test it. Make sure that it works. And you're going to find that if you do that, you're going to uh, find your problems you know, uh, quicker um, because you're not troubleshooting large, large chunks of code. And so top down coding and testing is just the idea of coding in small, small chunks and testing it in small chunks. It's a very efficient way of writing and testing software. Okay, now into the tools. Okay, so this is a lot of the theory that we've covered so far. Um, up until um, slide 20. Slide 20, um, is, these are the tools. Okay, it's actually time to use some tools. Um, and so the first tool, like if this is some code uh, that, that uh, you know, is broken and a student calls me over to check it out, and it's like, okay, let me use it here. And well, calculate miles per gallon doesn't work. And I, I was, you know, you can click it a thousand million. You know, it doesn't matter how many times you click it. You, you just want to keep clicking it, but it still isn't going to work. Um, the first thing to do um, at this point. So, so probably what you're going to do, what you're going to want to do, is you're going to want to just look at the code, and, and that's the tool on your tool belt thus far has been to just, okay, it doesn't work. Well, let me go back into the code and see if I can figure out what the heck's going on. And that's not an efficient way of solving a, a, a bug or debugging the software. And here's why. <laughs> the reason this is not efficient is, I don't know what it's called. There is it's basically the way that our minds work as human beings. If we wrote this code, we tend to think that our code is fine, that it's not it's not my code that's the problem. The problem is the computer or the problem is the time of day or the weather outside or you know they as human beings, unfortunately, our minds always want to blame other factors. Um, and so what happens when you, when you really don't believe that your code is the problem, you don't critically analyze each line for a mistake. Because subconsciously, you're thinking, I didn't do anything wrong. I wrote good code. 
And and so what happens is instead of looking at this line by line very critically, um, you kind of skim it. And when you skim it, you overlook the problems very, very quickly. You're quick to overlook the problems with the code. Um, so, so that's why, that's why you can look at your own code for 30 minutes and not see the bug. And then you call, call me over or maybe a lab partner over and you say, I can't find this. Can you, can you see this? And then within, within a split second, someone else might find the bug because they are a new set of eyes or fresh set of eyes that are going to look at your code a little bit more critically and differently than you might. Okay. So so looking at the code really isn't the best first step. Um, because we're, we're just pro, we're not programmed to find our own mistakes. Um, which maybe you've heard of a uh, rubber duck troubleshooting. It's kind of a silly um, rubber duck debugging. And it's kind of a silly thing that... Um, you put a, a rubber duck on the corner of your laptop, and the what what this is is a way. It's kind of silly, but you're supposed to talk to the rubber duck and explain to the rubber duck what your code is doing and why it's doing what it's doing. And what happens then if you if you talk through the problem, you slow down a little bit, and you start to you know explain to the rubber duck at a basic level what it's supposed to be doing, and then oftentimes. Um, you find your own problem because you're looking more critically at your code. Okay, so that's kind of a funny little uh, thing there that exists. Rubber duck debugging. Okay, but I don't, I don't, again, I don't like to start just by looking at the code. What I'm going to do first time and just about every time, I'm going to go right to the console. So you guys remember the inspect tool from HTML, okay? Um, this is inspecting our on the elements. This allows us to look at our CSS and our HTML. However, the console, this is going to be our JavaScript tool that's going to help us find JavaScript mistakes. Um, when I click here, the first thing that loads here is this this uncaught reference error. Notice every time I let me uncheck that. Notice every time I click here, it's throwing. You can see this counter going up, and it says calculate MPG is not defined. I can even click on this, and it tells me the line number that it's basically breaking on line 26. Okay, well that's already more efficient than me starting up at the top at line 8 and trying to find the problem. It's identifying that something about line 26 is off. Okay, so I, it's really as simple as this. Open up the console in Google Chrome. And that's the first step that you want to do. Uh, almost 100% almost of the time, I don't want to say 100% because it's never 100%, but most of the time... Open this up and see what kind of errors that you're getting. Now, you might get this failed to load resource, server not responded with status 404. Fave icon, okay, I know the problem's not with the fave icon. I think I think this is something that Live Server does as part of um, you know that extension on Visual Studio. Um, so I, I tend to ignore this one, okay? Don't, don't get thrown off by that and don't get live, you know, so what happens is Live Server kind of puts some stuff in there for us so we don't, it's it's interfering with this anyways uh we know line 26 is the problem so let's go to line 26 and say okay well i got a problem with line 26 um okay so what what is line 26 doing um line 26 is targeting the miles per gallon text box which is this one right here so here's our text box it's disabled okay remember that this this dollar sign is this just this uh, shortcut function that allows us to replace document get element by ID with a dollar sign? So instead of type, typing document get element by ID, instead of typing this, now because we wrote that function, we can just replace it with a dollar sign. Okay, that's 
remember I said I'm not a big fan of that, but but the book uses it, so there it is. And it, again, it's a shortcut. It's a function called dollar sign. So we're putting the value and we're assigning the value of that text box equal to the result that's returned from this calculate miles per gallon. Here's this function called calculate miles per gallon. This function takes in two inputs. It's going to divide the miles divided by the gallon. So 100 miles divided by two gallons, the math looks right. Um, and then it's going to round it. Uh, I believe if you don't pass a number, I believe the default is a, a two fixed of two. And then it's going to return the miles per gallon. It's going to return the result of that math. So that all looks good. So, um, you know, so again, I'm not seeing it. Like, uh, calculate miles per gallon. This function looks good. It's going to put that, but clearly something's not working. Um, so if you look closely, you might see it. Does anyone see the bug? And I know that it's kind of in that area. This is one thing that I need to get better at is asking questions during my lectures. It's just the engagement is low. Normally the engagement during my lectures is better. We got some animated GIFs here, people looking for it. Well, um, when, you, when you do see it, um, take a look at line 12. We're creating a function called calc mpg. And then line 26 calls that function calc mpg. There we go, the casing of miles per gallon. So when you see it, it becomes pretty obvious that we said it's case sensitive. One was using lowercase, one was not. So, um, you know simple thing to see once you see it but it might maybe it took you a second uh, say 110 to calculate miles per gallon you get five okay so you know this process of using the council to find the errors these aren't necessarily these are not syntax errors because the program was running to a point the program the program ran until a point it kind of got to right here where it broke so all of this code ran in fact you could run this and you probably saw I got a, uh, a validation error like the validation error was working but the calculation was not working so the, the this is this would be an example of a runtime error because while the program was running, uh, there was there was an error that was encountered, and that error was the um, the casing there. Yeah, you know, um, Visual Studio is um, is decent at finding errors. Uh, specifically the syntax errors, but Visual Studio is not as good at finding the runtime errors. Um, but if you like forget the quotes here, you know, Visual Studio is going to kind of let you know what the color is right there, you know, unterminated literal string. Um, my, my sense is that I, I use Visual Studio as a tool to help me find the errors but I don't expect it to catch all of the errors. Um, because again, it's just a piece of software and it's trying to help, but it can't possibly help in all the cases. Okay, so, so the council window, this is like automatic. This is automatic. If my JavaScript doesn't work, I go to council. It's don't even think don't even think twice about where to go. So one question is, I still don't understand when to put the script in the head or the bottom of the body. Um, rule of thumb, just put it in the bottom. Um, just put it in the bottom. Now, if you wait for the window to load, if you do a window on load, and then you put all of your JavaScript for window on load, then it's okay to put it in the head. 
Because what's what the window on load does is it waits for the HTML to load before it runs the JavaScript. Okay, so if you if you put all of your JavaScript on a window on load, and you you wait to run anything until the window loads, then you can put it up in the head. But it's just kind of a rule of thumb. So that's that's part of it. The other thing is. Uh, putting it at the bottom loads all of the HTML first and then it loads all the JavaScript second. So the other benefit of putting it in the bottom is you're waiting for all the HTML to load um, before loading the JavaScript and that's going to provide a better experience for your end users. They're going to start to see the content before your JavaScript loads. Yeah, it is. Yeah, you're correct. So, so at the bottom is just kind of the, the general recommendation. Okay, they kind of go through the different ways to get into the develop, developer tools. I just right click and inspect um, in Chrome. Okay, the next tool is the sources. And so if I kind of go back into here, let's, let's bring back our, our poorly named function. Let me just say calc m. PPG, okay. So I say bring this error back, calculate, nothing happens, inspect, counsel. Um, if I click on this line, notice what it opens up is the sources. Okay, so it actually changes windows when I click on this link, it opens up the sources and it highlights the line and kind of tells you the problem. Now, let me reload this page. Let me close this. Now, the sources window is used in other ways. Okay, check this out. Okay, um, if I click on the number eight, notice it turns it blue. All right, this is this is a, a very useful tool. All right. This is called a breakpoint. Notice over here, it adds this little thing called a breakpoint. So you just click in the margin over here on the number. Okay, so I'll click on line 18. So what a breakpoint is, is it's a way to stop the JavaScript running at that line whenever that line is run. Okay, that, that line, in this case, if we're looking at this, the window on load calls process entries. So this function will run when the page loads. Oh, I'm sorry, not on the page load. This, when the window loads, this process entries runs on click. Oh, that doesn't make sense. It makes more sense. Now process entries runs on click. That makes sense. So when the page loads, it wires up this event handler that says, when you click the button, call process entries. Okay, so I'm gonna refresh the page. I've got a breakpoint in here now. I'm gonna say 10 and two. I'm gonna click calculate miles per gallon. Now watch what happens to my breakpoint. I'm gonna click calculate miles per gallon and it highlights the line, line 18. So that means that line 18 has not run yet. And so this is, this tool is very useful for letting us run our JavaScript line by line and inspecting our variables. So watch what happens after I run line 18. I'm gonna hit, this is, this is the, uh, the button that you normally use, which is step into, see this little down arrow. We're gonna step into. Now, notice what happens is this, this dollar sign function is called. So notice where it goes up to, it goes up to line 10. So it runs line 10 because that's the dollar sign function. Okay, so it finished line 18 and now you can see that miles holds a value of 10. It actually, you know, after line 18 executes, it now tells us more about what that variable holds at that point in the JavaScript. And you can see over here in the in the scope window, you've got local scope and you can see that miles holds a value of 10. You can see that gallons is currently undefined. That's because gallons line 19 has not run yet. So if I step into 
it goes up to the dollar sign function click again click again click again click again now gallons holds the value of two now it says if miles is not a number or gallons is not a number notice it skips that because those are both false else if miles is less than or gallons is less than zero those are both false so it's skipping that now it's going to go to the dollar sign function and get the miles per gallon and that's where it breaks so that's that line right there when it went to call miles per gallon it kind of you'll notice it kind of jumped and it stopped normal flow here so it, instead of going to our function call which was what it should have done um, it basically it kind of paused the debugger and the only way out of this is to just click on this resume okay in which case this file that it opened up you don't even need so that's that's where you you actually got to see it break right you got to see your JavaScript break it went from your code that you were writing into something like that made no sense so this is another troubleshooting tool this breakpoint stepping into your code and watching the variables as your code executes that tool right there is one of the most if not the most useful troubleshooting tool that you can have in your toolkit to learn to fix code okay something as simple as a breakpoint and stepping through your code line by line um, to troubleshoot what's going on it is and I don't know how to I don't know how to emphasize this enough if you're going to be good at software development you need to know how to troubleshoot your code and you need to know how to use breakpoints it is it's the difference between you being able to solve problems and not and in, in the real world, that's what you're getting paid for. You're getting paid for solving problems. Uh, so if you're unable to solve problems, then then you, you might not be too good at this at, at the job. Um, so breakpoints and, and the thing about breakpoints is that they're not if you learn them here, if you learn breakpoints in this class, there's breakpoints in many languages, right? So all these different languages have the ability to break your code at, at a certain point and then step through your code line by line by line and inspect what's going on okay um you know you might have you might have um a loop that's not behaving the way it needs to behave and if you put a breakpoint in you can literally watch the loop iterate iterate uh, loop by loop by loop and watch your variables change loop by loop by loop yeah the first thing that you, that you do is you need to set the breakpoint before you can go through line by line so the way that you do that is inspect and then you go to sources I had to close that file and it should load up here your your JavaScript should load up and over here you might have to double click index.html to get it to load up like if this is closed you might see this and you might have to double click the index and then and then you just click on the number and then the next time you might have to reload the page you know if, if it's something on load but if it's not on load the next time you click and then process entries runs you see that blue line that means you're in the break mode so you have to set the breakpoint before you get into this break mode <clears throat> now there are a few I showed you the step into button remember step into is this little one right here okay it's the easiest one to hit there's there's some other ones step over step out and resume 
Um, the resume is just this little play. So like if you're tired of clicking next, 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 and you just want to resume the whole thing running, you just click this little bloom button and that's resume. Uh, and that, that'll just finish running your code. Um, step over. If you have a function that you know is good and you don't need to troubleshoot that function, you can step over the function. In other words, like I know the dollar sign function is good. I don't need to step into the dollar sign function. I can step over it and go to the next line. Um, and so that's step over. And then step out is the idea of, okay, maybe you're in a function and you're troubleshooting it and you're like, uh, I don't need to troubleshoot this anymore. You could step back out of the function and go back to the line that called the function. And so, you know, you can get intimidated by all these. I think as long if you're learning one today, learn step into because that's the one that's most useful. Okay, and I showed you how to look at your variables in the local section of the scope window. Okay, another thing that you can do is a console.log. Console.log would be, okay, well, I, I couldn't even tell at some point that this, this function was running. And so what I might do, you might do an alert, but alerts can be pretty annoying. I'm sure if you've followed along this far in the class, you're probably, probably pretty tired of alerts. So console.log allows you to just kind of write a message into the browser log. And so if I click calculate miles per gallon and I inspect and I go to council, you could see that I'm getting a, I'm hitting my breakpoint. My breakpoint's still there. But in the council window, I'm getting a message. Is this working? Okay, so this is just a little message that you write to the council to test things out. Um, maybe I want to keep track of the number of times the user clicked the button, you know. So I could say let num clicks equal zero. So we're setting num clicks equal to zero. And then is this working plus num clicks so it'll output the number of clicks every time there and then I'll increase num clicks plus plus by one I'll set I'll start it off at one instead of starting off at zero I need to take my breakpoint out and I need to get my MPG working here. So MPG is all caps. Let's bring that in here. So now my function is working again and I'm going to remove my breakpoint because I'm not troubleshooting that problem anymore. So let's go to sources. I'm going to remove my breakpoint. I'll go back to the council window 10 and 2. Okay, um, and so how is this useful? Well, maybe you have a loop and what you do is you wanna watch the value of your, of your uh, variables in your loop, but you don't wanna step through the loop a thousand times. So if you're using breakpoints and you've got a loop that iterates a thousand times, you want, do you wanna sit there and click next, 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 a thousand times to watch your loop iterate a thousand times at, at once? Probably not. So what you would do is you would use a console.log to log the variable values each time through the loop. And that way you don't have to step through a loop that iterates a thousand times. Okay, this is, this is actually a process called tracing. Okay, you trace the value of your variables while your program runs um, using a, a console.log. So that's called tracing. Actually, yeah, see, uh, the log statements that trace the execution of code. So that's the tracing that I'm talking about. 
and here they do some math each time in the loop and you can see each time through the loop this number is is growing in size and so you can kind of watch the output you know you can watch this number grow through the loop and, and what's happening at each iteration through the loop so tracing is really useful tool uh, as well okay you guys already know how to view source uh, the last things here they talk about is um, as always you need to write valid HTML and you need to write valid CSS uh, if your HTML is not valid um, there's there's a good chance that that could conflict with your JavaScript okay um, so that's kind of like the last little catch-all is that you know if you've got a header tag that isn't properly closed in your HTML uh, that can cause all sorts of issues and your JavaScript might not know how to interact with that header tag uh, and that could cause bugs and errors and things of that nature is there a validator for JavaScript um yeah that well really the the validator that we're using is the council and the council is going to tell us our errors and so the closest the closest thing that I have in this class to to the external validators is is the council window built into Chrome um, once once you really start getting into um, there there's something called JS lint um, that that can kind of help you with with some of the finding some of the bugs um, but it's not really something that's needed in this class really just the council window is really all that you need okay all right uh, let me go ahead and stop the recording